Chapter 3 Mischief and Craft Mischief and craft are plainly seen to be characteristics of this creature. Claudius Elianus, 3rd century AD, writing about the octopus. In a sponge garden, someone is watching you intently, but you can't see them. Then you notice, drawn somehow by their eyes. You're amid a sponge garden, the sea floor scattered with shrub-like clumps of bright orange sponge. Tangled in one of these sponges and the grey-green seaweed around it is an animal about the size of a cat. Its body, though, seems to be everywhere and nowhere. Much of the animal seems to have no definite shape at all. The only parts you can keep a fix on are a small head and the two eyes. As you make your way around the sponge, so too do those eyes, keeping their distance, keeping part of the sponge between the two of you. Its colour matches, exactly, perfectly, the seaweed around it, except that some of its skin is folded into tiny tower-like peaks, and the tips of these peaks match, nearly as exactly, the orange of the sponge. You keep coming round its side of the sponge, and eventually it raises its head high, then rockets away under jet propulsion. A second meeting with an octopus. This one is in a den. Shells are strewn in front, arranged with some pieces of old glass. You stop in front of its house and the two of you look at each other. This one is small, about the size of a tennis ball. You reach forward a hand and stretch out one finger and one octopus arm slowly uncoils and comes out to touch you. The suckers grab your skin and the hold is disconcertingly tight. Having attached the suckers, it tugs your finger, pulling you gently in. The arm is packed with sensors, hundreds of them in each of the dozens of suckers. It's tasting your finger as it draws it in. The arm itself is alive with neurons, a nest of nervous activity. Behind the arm, large round eyes watch you the whole time hundreds of millions of years on from the events of Chapter 2. This is one place the evolution of animals has landed. Evolution of the Cephalopods Octopuses and other cephalopods are mollusks. They belong to a large group of animals which also includes clams, oysters and snails. Part of the story of the octopus, then, is the evolutionary history of mollusks. In the previous chapter, we reached the Cambrian, the period in the history of life when a great range of animal body plans appear in the fossil record. Many of these animal groups, including mollusks, must predate the Cambrian, but in the Cambrian, mollusks become noticeable because of their shells. Shells were the mollusks' response to what looks like an abrupt change in the lives of animals, the invention of predation. There are various ways of dealing with the fact that you are suddenly surrounded by creatures who can see and would like to eat you, but one way, a molluscan specialty, is to grow a hard shell and live within or beneath it. The cephalopod line probably goes back to an early mollusk of this kind, crawling along the bottom of the sea under a hard shell, peaked like a cap. This animal looked a bit like a limpet one of those plain cup-like shellfish that grip rocks in tide pools today. The cap grew Pinocchio-like over evolutionary time, slowly taking the shape of a horn. These animals were small. The horn was less than an inch long. Beneath the shell, as with other mollusks, a muscular foot anchored the animal and enabled it to crawl along the seafloor. Then, at a stage later in the Cambrian, some of these animals rose from the seafloor and entered the water column. On dry land, no effortless move up into the air is possible for an animal. Such a move requires the expense of wings or something similar. In the sea, you can lift off easily, be carried, and see where you end up. An upward-pointing shell which protects can be made into a buoyancy device by filling it with gas. Early cephalopods seem to have done just that. Making the shell buoyant may have initially enabled easier crawling, and many of the old cephalopods might have moved by engaging in a half-crawl, half-swim on the bottom of the sea. Some, though, rose higher, 
and found a world of opportunity above. A small amount of gas held within the shell will turn a limpet into a zeppelin. Once aloft, the foot is no use for crawling, so the zeppelin cephalopods invented jet propulsion by directing water through a tube-like siphon which could be pointed in several directions. The foot itself was freed up for grasping and manipulating objects, and part of it flowered into a cluster of tentacles. Talk of flowering would sound inappropriate, though, to the animals on the other end of these tentacles, the animals being grasped, as some of the tentacles sprouted dozens of sharp hooks. The opportunity the cephalopods were seizing by rising up into the water was the opportunity to feed on other animals, to become predators themselves. This they did with great evolutionary enthusiasm. Many forms appeared with straight shells and coiled, and the largest reached sizes of 18 feet or more. Beginning as diminutive limpets, cephalopods had become the most fearsome predators in the sea. As well as zeppelins, a range of cephalopod hovercrafts and tanks probably prowled the sea floor. Some of the shells from this time seemed too unwieldy to carry in the open water. All these animals are now extinct, with one non-fearsome exception, the Nautilus. Many of the losses occurred as part of the mass extinctions that punctuate the history of life, but it's also likely that some predatory cephalopods were slowly outcompeted by fish, as those fish became larger and better armed. The zeppelins were challenged, and eventually vanquished, by airplanes. The Nautilus, however, made it through. No one knows why. At the start of this book I cited a Hawaiian creation myth that judges the octopus a lone survivor from an earlier world. The real survivor is indeed a cephalopod, but Nautilus rather than octopus. Still living in the Pacific, present-day Nautiluses are little changed from 200 million years ago, living in coiled shells. They're now scavengers. They have simple eyes and a cluster of tentacles, and they move up and down from the deep sea to shallower water in a rhythm that's still being studied. They seem to stay higher in the water at night, deeper in the day. Another shift was to come in the evolution of cephalopod bodies. Sometime before the age of the dinosaurs, it seems, some cephalopods began to give up their shells. The protective casings that had become buoyancy devices were abandoned, reduced, or internalized. This enabled more freedom of movement, but at the price of greatly increased vulnerability. It seems quite a gamble, but this was a path taken several times. The last common ancestor of modern cephalopods is not known, but at some stage the lineage split into two main branches, an eight-armed group including octopuses and a ten-armed group including cuttlefish and squid. These animals reduced their shells in different ways. In the cuttlefish, a shell was retained internally and still helps the animal remain buoyant. In squid, a sword-shaped internal structure called a pen remains. Octopuses have lost their shell entirely. Many cephalopods began to live as soft-bodied, unprotected animals on reefs in shallow seas. The oldest possible octopus fossil dates from 290 million years ago. I emphasize the uncertainty. It's just one specimen and little more than a smudge on a rock. After this, there's a gap in the record, and then, at around 164 million years ago, there's a clearer case, a fossil that looks undeniably like an octopus, with eight arms and an octopus-like pose. The fossil record of octopuses remains skimpy because they don't preserve well. But at some stage, they radiated. Around 300 species are known at present, including deep sea as well as reef-dwelling forms. They range from less than an inch in length to the giant Pacific octopus, which weighs in at 100 pounds and spans 20 feet from arm tip to arm tip. That's the journey of the cephalopod body, a path from Ediacaran macaron through limpet-like shellfish to predatory hovercraft and zeppelin. The encumbrance of the external shell is then abandoned as the shell is brought inside the body or in an octopus lost completely. With that step, the octopus loses almost all definite shape.
to completely forego both skeleton and shell is an unusual evolutionary move for a creature of this size and complexity. An octopus has almost no hard parts at all, its eyes and beak are the largest, and as a result it can squeeze through a hole about the size of its eyeball and transform its body shape almost indefinitely. The evolution of cephalopods yielded in the octopus a body of pure possibility. During the time I was writing an early version of this chapter, I spent a few days watching a pair of octopuses in the rocky shallows. I saw them mate once, and then spend much of the next afternoon just sitting, it seemed. The female moved off a little way, but returned to her den as the sun got low. The male had spent the day in a more exposed spot, less than a foot from her den. He was there when she came back. I watched them, off and on, for two afternoons, and then storms came. Winds of sixty miles per hour lashed the coast and waves rolled in from the south. The bay where the octopuses live has some protection from this onslaught, but not much. Waves swept around the entrance and turned the water into a boiling white soup. The shore was beaten by these storms for the next four days. Where do the octopuses go when the waves are pounding their rocks? It was impossible to get into the water to see. The cuttlefish have no problem. They disappear for weeks when the weather is bad. They fire up their jet propulsion and move off to some unknown deeper place. Perhaps the octopuses also move further out to sea, but more likely they climb into a crevice and hang on for days at a stretch, recalling their ancestors who gripped rocks from inside cap-shaped shells. Puzzles of Octopus Intelligence as the cephalopod body evolved toward its present-day forms, another transformation occurred. Some of the cephalopods became smart. Smart is a contentious term to use, so let's begin cautiously. First, these animals evolved large nervous systems, including large brains. Large in what sense? A common octopus... Octopus vulgaris has about 500 million neurons in its body. That's a lot by almost any standard. Humans have many more, something like 100 billion. But the octopus is in the same range as various smaller mammals, close to the range of dogs. And cephalopods have much larger nervous systems than all other invertebrates. Absolute size is important, but is usually regarded as less informative than relative size. The size of the brain is a fraction of the size of the body. This tells us how much an animal is investing in its brain. This comparison is made by weight and only counts the neurons in the brain. Octopuses also score high by this measure, roughly in the range of vertebrates, though not as high as mammals. Biologists regard all these assessments of size, though, as only a very rough guide to the brain power an animal has. Some brains are organised differently from others with more or fewer synapses, and those synapses can also be more or less complicated. The most startling finding in recent work on animal intelligence is how smart some birds are, especially parrots and crows. Birds have quite small brains in absolute terms, but very high-powered ones. When we try to compare one animal's brain power with another's, we also run into the fact that there is no single scale on which intelligence can be sensibly measured. Different animals are good at different things, as makes sense given the different lives they live. An analogy can be drawn with toolkits. Brains are like toolkits for the control of behaviour. As with human toolkits, there are some elements in common across many trades, but much diversity also. All the toolkits found in animals include some kind of perception, though different animals have very different ways of taking in information. All, or almost all, bilaterian animals have some form of memory and a means for learning, enabling past experiences to be brought to bear on the present. The toolkit sometimes includes capacities for problem-solving and planning, some toolkits are more elaborate and expensive than others, but they can be sophisticated in different ways. One animal might have better senses, while another may have more sophisticated learning. Different toolkits go with different ways of making a living. 
When comparing cephalopods with mammals, the difficulties are acute. Octopuses and other cephalopods have exceptionally good eyes, and these are eyes built on the same general design as ours. Two experiments in the evolution of large nervous systems landed on similar ways of seeing. But the nervous systems beneath those eyes are organized very differently. When biologists look at a bird, a mammal, even a fish, they're able to map many parts of one animal's brain onto another's. Vertebrate brains all have a common architecture. When vertebrate brains are compared to octopus brains, all bets, or rather all mappings, are off. There's no part-by-part -part correspondence between the parts of their brains and ours. Indeed, octopuses have not even collected the majority of their neurons inside their brains. Most of the neurons are found in their arms. Given all this, the way to work out how smart octopuses are is to look at what they can do. Here we quickly encounter puzzles. Perhaps the heart of the matter is a mismatch between the results of laboratory experiments on learning and intelligence on one side and a range of anecdotes and one-off reports on the other. Mismatches like this are common in the world of animal psychology, but they're especially acute in the case of octopuses. When tested in the lab, octopuses have done fairly well without showing themselves to be Einsteins. They can learn to navigate simple mazes. They can use visual cues to determine which of two possible environments they've been placed in and then take the correct route to a goal for that environment. They can learn to unscrew jars to obtain the food inside. But octopuses are slow learners in all these contexts. When you read the fine print of a successful experiment, progress often seems agonizingly slow. Against a background of mixed experimental results, though, there are anecdotes suggesting that a lot more is going on. What I find most intriguing is the octopus's ability to adapt to new and unusual circumstances, confinement in a lab, and turn the apparatus around them to their own octopodian purposes. A lot of early octopus work was done in Italy at the Naples Zoological Station in the middle of the 20th century. Peter Dews was a Harvard scientist who worked mostly on the interaction between drugs and behaviour. He had a general interest in learning, though, and his octopus experiment did not involve drugs at all. Dews was influenced by his Harvard colleague B. F. Skinner, whose work on operant conditioning, the learning of behaviours by reward and punishment, had revolutionised psychology. The idea that successful behaviours will be repeated and unsuccessful ones abandoned had been pioneered by Edward Thorndike around 1900, but Skinner developed the idea in great detail. Dews, with many others, was inspired by the way Skinner was able to make animal experiments rigorous and exact. In 1959, Dews applied some standard experiments on learning and reinforcement to octopuses. Octopuses may be distantly related to vertebrates like us, but do they learn in similar ways? Can they learn, for example, that pulling and releasing a lever will get them a reward and come to produce this behaviour at will? I first came across Dews's work through a brief mention of his experiment in Roger Hanlon and John Messenger's book, Cephalopod Behaviour. Hanlon and Messenger comment that pulling and releasing a lever is surely something an octopus would never do in the sea, and they say that Dews's experiment was not successful. I was curious about how things went, though, so I went back to the 1959 paper. The first thing I noticed is that the experiment was successful with respect to its main goals. Dews trained three octopuses and found that all three of them did learn to operate the lever to obtain food. When they pulled the lever, a light came on and a small piece of sardine was given as a reward. Two of the octopuses, named Albert and Bertram, did this in a reasonably consistent manner, Dews said. The behaviour of the third octopus, named Charles, was different. Though Charles did pass the test in a minimal way, his handling of the situation encapsulates much of the story with octopus behaviour. Dews wrote... 1. Whereas Albert and Bertram gently operated the lever while free-floating, Charles anchored several tentacles on the side of the tank and others around the lever and applied great force. The lever was bent a number of times and, on the eleventh day, 
was broken, leading to a premature termination of the experiment. 2. The light suspended a little above the level of the water was not the subject of much attention by Albert or Bertram, but Charles repeatedly encircled the lamp with tentacles and applied considerable force, tending to carry the light into the tank. This behaviour is obviously incompatible with lever-pulling behaviour. 3. Charles had a high tendency to direct jets of water out of the tank. Specifically, they were in the direction of the experimenter. The animal spent much time with eyes above the surface of the water, directing a jet of water at any individual who approached the tank. This behaviour interfered materially with the smooth conduct of the experiments, and is, again, clearly incompatible with lever-pulling. Dew's comments dryly, the variables responsible for the maintenance and strengthening of the lamp-pulling and squirting behaviour in this animal were not apparent. The language Dews is using here, the language of variables responsible and so on, shows that he is thinking, or writing at least, in line with the assumptions of mid-twentieth century animal behaviour experiments. He assumes that if Charles is squirting experimenters and absconding with the apparatus, this must be because something in Charles's history has reinforced this behaviour. Animals of a given species will start out the same on this view, and if they diverge in behaviour, this must be because of rewarding or unrewarding experiences. That is the framework Dews is working within. However, one message of octopus experiments is that there is a great deal of individual variability. Charles, most likely, was not an octopus who started with the same behavioural routines as the others and was reinforced for squirting experimenters, but an octopus with a particularly feisty temperament. This 1959 paper was one of the first encounters between a tightly controlled style of scientific work on animal behaviour and the idiosyncrasies of the octopus. A great deal of work on animals has been done under the assumption that all animals of a given species, and perhaps of a given sex, will be very similar until they encounter different rewards, and will peck or run or pull a lever all day in order to get the same little morsels of food. Dews, like many others, wanted to work this way because he was determined to use what he called objective, quantitative methods of study. I'm all for those too, but octopuses, far more than rats and pigeons, have their own ideas, mischief and craft, as Aelianus in this chapter's epigraph had it. The most famous octopus anecdotes are tales of escape and thievery in which octopuses in aquariums raid neighbouring tanks at night for food. Those stories, despite their charm, are not especially indicative of high intelligence. Neighbouring tanks are not so different from tide pools, even though the entrance and exit take more effort. Here is a behaviour I find more intriguing. Octopuses in at least two aquariums have learned to turn off the lights by squirting jets of water at the bulbs when no one is watching and short-circuiting the power supply. At the University of Otago in New Zealand, this became so expensive that the octopus had to be released back to the wild. A lab in Germany had the same problem. This seems very smart indeed. However, one can also sketch an explanation which may partially deflate the story. Octopuses don't like bright lights, and they squirt jets of water at all sorts of things that annoy them, as Peter Dews discovered. So squirting water at lights might not be something that requires much explanation. Also, octopuses are more likely to roam far enough away from their dens to squirt at this particular target when no humans are around. On the other hand, both the stories of this kind that I've seen give the impression that the octopus learned very quickly how well this behaviour works, that it's worth getting into position and aiming right at the light to turn it out. It should be possible to set up an experiment that tests some of the various possible explanations for the behaviour. This case illustrates a more general fact. Octopuses have an ability to adapt to the special circumstances of captivity and their interaction with human keepers. Octopuses in the wild are fairly solitary animals, their social life in most species is thought to be minimal, though later I'll look at exceptions to this pattern. In the lab, however, they're often quick to get the hang of how life works in their new circumstances. 
For example, it has long appeared that captive octopuses can recognize and behave differently toward individual human keepers. Stories of this kind have been coming out of different labs for years. Initially, it all seemed anecdotal. In the same lab in New Zealand that had the lights out problem, an octopus took a dislike to one member of the lab staff for no obvious reason, and whenever that person passed by on the walkway behind the tank, she received a jet of half a gallon of water in the back of her neck. Shelley Adamo of Dalhousie University had one cuttlefish who reliably squirted streams of water at all new visitors to the lab, and not at people who were often around. In 2010, an experiment confirmed that giant Pacific octopuses can indeed recognize individual humans, and can do this even when the humans are wearing identical uniforms. Stefan Lindqvist, a philosopher who once studied octopus behavior in the lab, puts it like this. When you work with fish, they have no idea they're in a tank, somewhere unnatural. With octopuses, it is totally different. They know that they're inside this special place and you are outside it. All their behaviours are affected by their awareness of captivity. Lindquist's octopuses would mess around with their tank, manipulating and testing it. Lindquist had a problem with octopuses deliberately plugging the outflow valves on the tanks by poking in their arms, perhaps to increase the water level. Of course, this flooded the entire lab. Another tale that illustrates Lindquist's point was told to me by Jean Boll of Millersville University in Pennsylvania. Boll has a reputation as one of the most rigorous and critical of cephalopod researchers. She's known for her meticulous experimental designs and her insistence that cognition or thought in these animals should be hypothesized only when experimental results cannot be explained in any simpler way. But, like many researchers, she has a few tales of behaviour that are baffling in what they seem to show about the inner lives of these animals. One of these incidents has stayed in her mind for over a decade. Octopuses love to eat crabs, but in the lab they're often fed on thawed-out frozen shrimp or squid. It takes octopuses a while to get used to these second-rate foods, but eventually they do. One day, Boyle was walking down a row of tanks, feeding each octopus a piece of thawed squid as she passed. On reaching the end of the row, she walked back the way she'd come. The octopus in the first tank, though, seemed to be waiting for her. It had not eaten its squid, but instead was holding it conspicuously. As Boyle stood there, the octopus made its way slowly across the tank towards the outflow pipe, watching her all the way. When it reached the outflow pipe, still watching her, it dumped the scrap of squid down the drain. This story, along with all the tales of octopuses squirting experimenters, reminded me of something I'd seen myself. Captive octopuses often try to escape, and when they do, they seem unerringly able to pick the one moment you aren't watching them. If you have an octopus in a bucket of water, for example, it'll often look content enough in there. But if your attention strays for a second, when you look back, there will be an octopus quietly crawling across the floor. I thought I might be imagining this tendency, until I heard a talk a few years ago given by David Scheel, who works with octopuses full-time. He, too, said that octopuses seem to track in subtle ways whether he is watching them or not, and they make their move when he isn't. I suppose this makes sense as a natural behaviour in octopuses. You want to make a run for it when the barracuda is not looking at you rather than when he is. But the fact that octopuses can so quickly do this with humans, both with scuba mask and without, is impressive. As stories of this kind accumulate, an explanation suggests itself for the mixed results with octopuses in some standard learning experiments. It's often said that they don't do especially well in these experiments because the behaviours required are unnatural. Hanlon and Messenger said this about the Dews experiment with the lever pulling, for example. But octopus behaviour in laboratory settings indicates that unnatural is often no problem for them. Octopuses can open screw cap jars for food, and one has even been filmed opening such a jar from the inside. Behaviours don't get much more unnatural than that. 
I think the problems with the old Peter Dews experiments, such as they were, came in part from the assumption that an octopus would be interested in pulling a lever repeatedly to get pieces of sardine, collecting piece after piece of this second-rate food. Rats and pigeons will do things like that, but octopuses take a while to deal with each item of food, probably can't cram themselves and tend to lose interest. For at least some of them, taking the lamp down from above the tank and hauling it back to the den, that is more interesting. So is squirting the experimenters. In response to the difficulty of motivating the animals, some researchers regrettably have used negative reinforcement, electric shocks, more freely than they would with other animals. Quite a lot of the early work done in the Naples Zoological Station treated octopuses badly. Not only were electric shocks used, but many experiments included the removal of parts of the octopus's brain or the cutting of important nerves just to see what the octopus would do when it woke up. Until recently, octopuses could also be operated on without anaesthetic. As invertebrates, they were not covered by animal cruelty rules. Many of these early experiments make for distressing reading for someone who regards octopuses as sentient beings. Over the last decade, however, octopuses have often been listed as a kind of honorary vertebrate in rules governing their treatment in experiments, especially in the European Union. This is a step forward. Another octopus behaviour that has made its way from anecdote to experimental investigation is play, interacting with objects just for the sake of it. An innovator in cephalopod research, Jennifer Mather, along with Roland Anderson of the Seattle Aquarium, did the first studies of this behaviour, and it's now been investigated in detail. Some individual octopuses, and only some, will spend time blowing pill bottles around their tank with their jet, bouncing the bottle back and forth on the stream of water coming from the tank's intake valve. In general, the initial interest an octopus takes in any new object is gustatory. Can I eat it? But once an object is found to be inedible, that does not always mean it's uninteresting. Recent work in the lab by Michael Kuba has confirmed that octopuses can quickly tell that some items are not food and are often still quite interested in exploring and manipulating them. Visiting Octopolis In the first chapter, I described Matthew Lawrence's discovery of an octopus site on the east coast of Australia. Matt explored the bay by dropping an anchor off his small boat swimming down to pick it up and letting the drift of the boat guide his wandering over the seafloor. I should add that diving alone is a bad idea. Matt takes down a second air supply that is completely independent of the first in case things go wrong. Even then it's not recommended. In 2009 he came across a shell bed with about a dozen octopuses living on it. They seemed unconcerned by his presence, roaming and wrestling with each other as he watched. Matt marked the GPS coordinates of the spot and began visiting regularly. He'd watch and interact with the octopuses. They didn't seem to mind his presence at all, and some were curious enough to play with him and explore his equipment. His camera and air hoses soon had octopuses roaming over them. Others were too busy dealing with each other. Sometimes he saw what looked like a kind of bullying behaviour. An octopus would be sitting quietly in its den, and a larger one would come over jump on top of the den and wrestle furiously with the one below. After a great multicoloured convulsion, the octopus below would come flying out like a rocket, its body pale, and land a few metres away just off the shell bed. The aggressor octopus would wander back to its den. As time passed, Matt became more and more accustomed to dealing with these animals, and to this day it seems to me that the octopuses treat Matt differently from anyone else. Once, at a site close to this one, an octopus grabbed his hand and walked off with him in tow. Matt followed as if he were being led across the sea floor by a very small eight-legged child. The tour went on for ten minutes and ended at the octopus's den. Though he's not a biologist, Matt had a sense that his sight might be unusual. He posted some photos on a website that functions as an information centre for cephalopod-inclined hobbyists and scientists. 
There they were seen by the biologist Christine Hufford, who asked me, did I know this place? I was startled when I read about what he'd found, and Matt's site is only a few hours from Sydney. I got in touch when I was next in town and drove down to meet him. Matt, I found, is a scuba fanatic. He keeps his own air compressor in a garage where he concocts personalised mixes of enriched air to fill his tanks. Soon we were chugging out on his small boat to a spot in the middle of his bay where he set the anchor and we swam down the line, observed by just a few small fish. The site we now call Octopolis is about fifty feet down. It's almost invisible until you get quite close, and the sea floor around it is nondescript. Scallops live scattered in little clumps or on their own, and various kinds of seaweed waft about on the sand. My first trip to the site in cold winter water was quiet. We found just four octopuses who were not doing much. But I could tell it was an unusual place. There was a bed of scallop shells, as Matt had said, a couple of yards in diameter. It seemed to contain shells of many ages. An encrusted rock-like object, a foot high or so, sat in the middle, with the largest octopus on the site using it as a den. I took measurements and photos and began coming back whenever I could. Soon I was seeing the high concentrations of octopuses and complex behaviours that Matt had encountered on his first dives there. If we had air enough and time, I don't know how long we'd stay down there. When the site is active, it's enthralling. The octopuses eye each other from their dens among the shells. They periodically haul themselves out and move over the shell bed or away onto the sand. Some will pass by others without incident, but an octopus might also send out an arm to poke or probe at another. An arm or two might come back in response, and this leads sometimes to a settling down, with each octopus going on its way, but in other cases it prompts a wrestling match. In order to study changes in the shell bed, I once brought out some stakes and hammered them into the seafloor to mark the site's approximate boundaries. The stakes, about seven inches long, were made of plastic, so I taped a heavy metal bolt to each one to give it more weight. I drove the stakes in so that only an inch or so of each one sat above the sand and placed them at the four compass points. They're very inconspicuous, hard to see unless you know exactly where to look. Some months later I went out to the site again and found that one of the stakes had been hauled out and added to the pile of debris around one of the octopus dens some distance away. The stake, I think, would have been quickly found inedible and it was probably not especially useful as a barricade. But as with tape measures, cameras and many other things we bring down to the site, the stake's novelty seemed to make it interesting to an octopus. Other octopus manipulations of foreign objects are done for more practical reasons. In 2009, a group of researchers in Indonesia were surprised to see octopuses in the wild carrying around pairs of half-coconut shells to use as portable shelters. The shells... Neatly halved, must have been cut by humans and discarded. The octopuses put them to good use. One half-shell would be nested inside another and the octopus would carry the pair beneath its body as it stilt-walked across the sea bottom. The octopus would then assemble the halves into a sphere with itself inside. A wide range of animals use found objects for shelters. Hermit crabs are an example. And some use tools for collecting food including chimps and some crows. But to assemble and disassemble a compound object like this and put it to use is very rare. It's not clear what to compare this behaviour to, in fact. Many animals combine a variety of materials when making nests. A lot of nests are compound objects, but those are not disassembled, carried around and put back together. The coconut house behaviour illustrates what I see as the distinctive feature of octopus intelligence. It makes clear the way they have become smart animals. They're smart in the sense of being curious and flexible. They're adventurous, opportunistic. With this idea on the table, I can add more to my picture of how octopuses fit into the range of animals and the history of life. 
In the previous chapter, using some ideas from Michael Trestman, I said that across the wide range of animal body plans, only three groups contain some species with complex active bodies. Those are chordates, like us, anthropods, like insects and crabs, and a small group of mollusks, the cephalopods. The arthropods went down this road first in the early Cambrian, over 500 million years ago. The way they did this may have initiated a process of evolutionary feedback that soon encompassed everyone else. Arthropods were first, and chordates and cephalopods followed. Setting aside our own case, we can see a difference in the paths taken by the two other groups. Many arthropods specialise in social living and coordination. Not all of them do this. Indeed, the majority of arthropod species don't. But in the area of behaviour, many of the great arthropod achievements are social. This is seen especially in ant and honeybee colonies and in the air-conditioned cities built by termites. Cephalopods are different. They never went on to land, though some other mollusks did, and while they probably started on the road toward complex behaviour at a later date than the arthropods, they eventually evolved larger brains. Here I think of an ant colony as many organisms with many brains, not as one. In arthropods, very complex behaviours tend to be achieved through the coordination of many individuals. Some squid are social, but with nothing like the organisation of ants and honeybees. Cephalopods, with the partial exception of squid, acquired a non-social form of intelligence. The octopus, most of all, would follow a path of lone, idiosyncratic complexity. Nervous evolution Let's look more closely now at what's inside an octopus and how the nervous system behind these behaviours evolved. The history of large brains has very roughly the shape of a letter Y. At the branching centre of the Y is the last common ancestor of vertebrates and mollusks. From here, many paths run forward, but I single out two of them, one leading to us and one to cephalopods. What features were present at that early stage, available to be carried forward down both paths? The ancestor at the centre of the Y certainly had neurons. It was probably a worm-like creature with a simple nervous system, though. It may have had simple eyes. Its neurons may have been partly bunched together at its front, but there wouldn't have been much of a brain there. From that stage, the evolution of nervous systems proceeds independently in many lines, including two that led to large brains of different design. In our lineage, the chordate design emerges with a cord of nerves down the middle of the animal's back and a brain at one end. This design is seen in fish, reptiles, birds and mammals. On the other side, the cephalopod side, a different body plan evolved and a different kind of nervous system. These nervous systems are more distributed, less centralised than ours. Invertebrates' neurons are often collected into many ganglia, little knots that are spread through the body and connected to each other. The ganglia can be arranged in pairs, linked by connectors that run along the body and across it like lines of latitude and longitude. This is sometimes called a ladder-like nervous system, and it does look like a ladder embedded within the body. The ancestral cephalopods probably had nervous systems something like this. So when evolution multiplied their neurons, the multiplication took place on this design. In that expansion, some ganglia became large and complex and new ones were added. Neurons concentrated at the front of the animal, forming something more and more like a definite brain. The old, ladder-like design was partly submerged, but only partly, and the underlying architecture of cephalopod nervous systems remains quite different from our own. Perhaps most oddly, the esophagus, the tube that carries food from the mouth into the body, passes through the middle of the central brain. This seems all wrong. Surely there was never supposed to be a brain there. If an octopus eats something sharp which pierces the side of its throat, the sharp object goes straight into its brain. 
octopuses have been discovered with exactly this problem. Further, much of a cephalopod's nervous system is not found within the brain at all, but spread throughout the body. In an octopus, the majority of the neurons are in the arms themselves, nearly twice as many as in the central brain. The arms have their own sensors and controllers. They've not only the sense of touch, but also the capacity to sense chemicals, to smell or taste. Each sucker on an octopus's arm may have 10,000 neurons to handle taste and touch. Even an arm that has been surgically removed can perform various basic motions, like reaching and grasping. How does an octopus's brain relate to its arms? Early work, looking at both behaviour and anatomy, gave the impression that the arms enjoyed considerable independence. The channel of nerves that leads from each arm back to the central brain seemed pretty slim. Some behavioural studies gave the impression that octopuses did not even track where their own arms might be. As Roger Hanlon and John Messenger put it in their book, Cephalopod Behaviour, the arms seemed curiously divorced from the brain, at least in the control of basic motions. The internal coordination of each arm can be quite graceful, too. When an octopus pulls in a piece of food, the grasping by the very end of the arm creates two waves of muscle activation, one heading inward from the tip and the other heading outward from the base. Where these two waves meet, a joint is formed that is something like a temporary elbow. The nervous systems in each arm also include loops in the neurons, recurrent connections in the jargon, that may give the arm a simple form of short-term memory though it's not known what this system does for the octopus. Octopuses can pull themselves together in some contexts, though, especially when it matters. As we heard at the beginning of this chapter, when you encounter and approach an octopus in the wild and pause in front of it, in at least some species, the octopus sends out one arm to inspect you. Often a second arm follows, but it's just one that comes out first as the animal watches. This suggests a kind of deliberateness, an action guided by the brain. Some sort of mixture of localised and top-down control might be operating. The best experimental work I know that bears on this topic comes out of Benjamin Hochner's laboratory at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem. A 2011 paper by Tamar Gutnick, Ruth Byrne and Michael Kuba, along with Hochner, described a very clever experiment. They asked whether an octopus could learn to guide a single arm along a maze-like path to a specific place in order to obtain food. The task was set up in such a way that the arm's own chemical sensors would not suffice to guide it to the food. The arm would have to leave the water at one point to reach the target location. But the maze walls were transparent so the target location could be seen. The octopus would have to guide an arm through the maze with its eyes. It took a long while for the octopuses to learn to do this, but in the end nearly all of the octopuses that were tested succeeded. The eyes can guide the arms. At the same time, the paper also noted that when octopuses are doing well with this task, the arm that's finding the food appears to do its own local exploration as it goes, crawling and feeling around. So it seems that two forms of control are working in tandem, there is central control of the arm's overall path via the eyes, combined with a fine-tuning of the search by the arm itself. Body and control. Half a billion neurons. Why so many? What do they do for the animal? In the previous chapter, I emphasised the expense of this machinery. Why did cephalopods go down this unusual evolutionary road? Nobody knows the answer to this, but I'll sketch some possibilities. The question arises to some degree for nearly all cephalopods, but I'll focus on octopuses. Octopuses are predators, and they hunt by moving rather than waiting in ambush. They rove around, often on reefs and shallow sea floors. When animal psychologists try to explain the evolution of a large brain, they often begin by looking at the social life of the animal. The complexities of social life seem to frequently give rise to high intelligence. Octopuses are not 
very social. In the final chapter, I'll look at exceptions to this, but social life is not a big part of the octopus story. A factor that seems more important is all that roving and hunting. To sharpen this idea up, I'll adapt some ideas developed in the 1980s by the primatologist Catherine Gibson. She was looking for an account of why some mammals evolved large brains and didn't consider their application to anything like an octopus. But I think her ideas might be relevant here too. Gibson distinguished two different ways of foraging for food. One way is to specialise on a food that requires little manipulation and can be handled the same way in every case. Her example was a frog catching flying insects. She contrasted this with extractive foraging, the kind that involves adapting choices to circumstances, removing food from protective shells and casings and doing so in a flexible and context-sensitive way. Compare the frog with a chimp who wanders about searching for a variety of things to eat, many of which require manipulation and extraction once they're found nuts, seeds, termites in their nests. Gibson's description of this flexible and demanding style of searching for food fits octopuses well. For many octopuses, crabs are at the top of the food preference list, but various additional animals, from scallops to fish, and other octopuses also count as food, and dealing with shells and other defences is often a significant task. David Scheel, who works mostly with the giant Pacific octopus, feeds his animals whole clams. But as his local animals in Prince William Sound do not routinely eat clams, he has to teach them about the new food source. So he partly smashes a clam and gives it to the octopus. Later, when he gives the octopus an intact clam, the octopus knows that it's food, but does not know how to get at the meat. The octopus will try all sorts of methods, drilling the shell and chipping the edges with its beak, manipulating it in every way possible, and then eventually it learns that its sheer strength is sufficient. If it tries hard enough, it can simply pull the shell apart. This style of hunting and foraging makes good sense of the exploratory, curious side of the octopus psyche, especially their engagement with novel objects. This factor is more applicable to octopuses than to cuttlefish and squid, which engage in less complicated manipulation of their food. Some cuttlefish have very large brains, perhaps even larger as a fraction of the body than octopuses. That is quite a mysterious fact at the moment, and less is known about what cuttlefish can do. While octopuses are not very social in the usual sense, the sense that involves spending a lot of time with other octopuses, their engagement with other animals as predators and as prey is social in a way. Those situations often require that an animal's actions be tuned to the actions and perspectives of others, including what those others can see and what they're likely to do. The demands of social life in the within-species sense have similarities to the demands of some kinds of hunting and avoiding being hunted oneself. Those features of the octopus lifestyle are probably part of the story behind its large nervous system. I now want to put another idea on the table as well. In Chapter 2, I contrasted sensory motor views and action-shaping views of the evolution of nervous systems. The action-shaping approach is less familiar, and it took some effort historically to develop it. The central idea is that rather than mediating between sensory input and behavioural output, the first nervous systems came to exist as solutions to a problem of pure coordination within the organism. The problem of how to coordinate the micro-acts of parts of the body into the macro-acts of the whole. The cephalopod body, and especially the octopus body, is a unique object with respect to these demands. When part of the molluscan foot differentiated into a mass of tentacles with no joints or shell, the result was a very unwieldy organ to control. The result was also an enormously useful thing, if it could be controlled. The octopus's loss 
of almost all hard parts compounded both the challenge and the opportunities. A vast range of movements became possible, but they had to be organised, had to be made coherent. Octopuses have not dealt with this challenge by imposing centralised governance on the body. Rather, they've fashioned a mixture of local and central control. One might say the octopus has turned each arm into an intermediate-scale actor. But it also imposes order top-down on the huge and complex system that is the octopus body. The demands of pure coordination, which might have been important in the early evolution of nervous systems, also here take on a latter-day role. They may have been responsible for much of the multiplication of neurons in the octopus. Those neurons are needed just to make the body controllable. Those solving the problem of coordination would explain the nervous system's size. It would not explain the octopus's intelligent and flexible behaviour. A well-coordinated animal could also be a rather uninventive animal. A more complete approach to the octopus might then combine these ideas about action shaping with the ideas about foraging and hunting that I borrowed from Gibson earlier. Those ideas would explain the animal's inventiveness, curiosity and sensory acuity. Or the story might more tendentiously go like this. A large nervous system evolves to deal with coordination of the body, but the result is so much neural complexity that eventually other capacities arise as byproducts, or relatively easy additions to what the demands of action shaping have built. I said or just before, byproducts or additions, but this is definitely an and or. Some capacities, such as recognition of individual people, might be byproducts while others, such as problem-solving, are the results of the evolutionary modification of the brain in response to the octopus's opportunistic lifestyle. In this picture, neurons first multiply because of the demands of the body, and then sometime later an octopus wakes up with a brain that can do more. Certainly it seems that some of its impressive behaviour is fortuitous from an evolutionary point of view. Remember again those Surprising behaviours in captivity, the mischief and craft, the engagement with humans. There is, it seems, a kind of mental surplus in the octopus. Convergence and Divergence I described how the early history of animals, insofar as we know it, led to a fork with one path running forward to chordates like us and the other leading to cephalopods, including the octopus. Let's take stock and compare what arose down the two evolutionary lines. The most dramatic similarity is the eyes. Our common ancestor may have had a pair of eye spots, but it did not have eyes anything like ours. Vertebrates and cephalopods separately evolved camera eyes with a lens that focuses an image on a retina. The capacity for learning of several kinds is also seen on both sides learning by attending to reward and punishment, by tracking what works and what does not work, seems to have been invented independently several times in evolution. If it was present in the human-octopus common ancestor, it was greatly elaborated down each of the two lines. There are also more subtle psychological similarities. Octopuses, like us, seem to have a distinction between short-term and long-term memory. They engage in play with novel objects that aren't food and have no apparent use. They seem to have something like sleep. Cuttlefish appear to have a form of rapid eye movement, REM sleep, like the sleep in which we dream. It's still unclear whether there's REM-like sleep in octopuses. Other similarities are more abstract, such as an involvement with individuals, including the ability to recognise particular humans. Our common ancestor surely could not do anything like this. It's hard to imagine what that simple little creature would have taken its world to contain. This ability makes sense if an animal is social or monogamous. But octopuses are not monogamous, have haphazard sex lives and seem not very social. 
There's a lesson here about the ways that smart animals handle the stuff of their world. They carve it up into objects that can be re-identified, despite ongoing changes in how those objects present themselves. I find this a striking feature of the octopus mind, striking in its familiarity, its similarity to our own. Some features show a mixture of similarity and difference, convergence and divergence. We have hearts, and so do octopuses. But an octopus has three hearts, not one. Their hearts pump blood that is blue-green, using copper as the oxygen-carrying molecule instead of the iron, which makes our blood red. Then, of course, there's the nervous system. Large, like ours, but built on a different design, with a different set of relationships between body and brain. The octopus is sometimes said to be a good illustration of the importance of a theoretical movement in psychology known as embodied cognition. These ideas were not developed to apply to octopuses, but to animals in general, including ourselves. And this view has also been influenced by robotics. One central idea is that our body itself, rather than our brain, is responsible for some of the smartness with which we handle the world. Our body's own structure encodes some information about the environment and how we must deal with it. So not all this information needs to be stored in the brain. The joints and angles of our limbs, for example, make motions such as walking naturally arise. Knowing how to walk is partly a matter of having the right body. As Hillel Cheel and Randall Beer put it, an animal's body structure creates both constraints and opportunities which guide its action. Some octopus researchers have been influenced by this way of thinking, especially Benny Hochner. Hochner believes these ideas can help us grasp the octopus-human differences. Octopuses have a different embodiment, which has consequences for their different kind of psychology. I agree with that last point. But the doctrines of the embodied cognition movement do not really fit well with the strangeness of the octopus's way of being. Defenders of embodied cognition often say that the body's shape and organisation encodes information. But that requires that there be a shape to the body, and an octopus has less of a fixed shape than other animals. The same animal can stand tall on its arms, squeeze through a hole little bigger than its eye, become a streamlined missile, or fold itself to fit into a jar. When advocates of embodied cognition such as Cheel and Beer give examples of how bodies provide resources for intelligent action, they mention the distances between parts of a body, which aid perception, and the locations and angles of joints. The octopus body has none of those things. No fixed distances between parts, no joints, no natural angles. Further, the relevant contrast in the octopus case is not body rather than brain, the contrast usually emphasised in discussions of embodied cognition. In an octopus, the nervous system as a whole is a more relevant object than the brain. It's not clear where the brain itself begins and ends, and the nervous system runs all through the body. The octopus is suffused with nervousness. The body is not a separate thing that is controlled by the brain or nervous system. The octopus indeed has a different embodiment, but one so unusual that it does not fit any of the standard views in this area. The usual debate is between those who see the brain as an all-powerful CEO and those who emphasize the intelligence stored in the body itself. Both views rely on a distinction between brain-based and body-based knowledge. The octopus lives outside both the usual pictures. Its embodiment prevents it from doing the sort of things that are usually emphasized in the embodied cognition theories. The octopus, in a sense, is disembodied. That word makes it sound immaterial, which is not, of course, what I have in mind. It has a body and is a material object. But the body itself is protean, all possibility. 
It has none of the costs and gains of a constraining and action-guiding body. The octopus lives outside the usual body-brain divide. 